So uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, on the way here, I actually found out that today's international speak like a pirate day. So welcome to the talk opening the jar. I'm sorry that won't happen again. Um, so today we'll be talking about jar files, about the way uh, dependencies can be found in those jar files. Um, and in general, how Java handles class loading and the loading of those dependencies. Um, we won't dive too deep on those uh, subjects because it's a little bit uh, technical and out of scope, but uh, we'll cover the most important part. So I'm Daniel Breger. I'm a security researcher at Palo Alto Networks. I study physics at the Open University of Israel, and I've been playing way too much Baldur's Gate the past uh, few weeks. So why did I choose to talk about this? So in the past few months, I've been talking about, I've been doing some research um, as part of uh, things that I've been doing at the company, and I came about the need to, ha to look at the jar file and analyze the dependencies that it includes. So I started to look how I, how I can do that. And I, d I, s I discovered that there is no single good resource that you can use to do that. Um, you have to go looking at various documentations of various uh, projects. You have to go look uh, to read the various blog posts that various people wrote. You need to go even actually open books in current year, way too much stuff. So I decided I need to make some kind of single resource that can be looked at and you can uh, just take, look, take a look at it and understand when you can find those dependencies. Um, now I acknowledge that there are various automatic tools that uh, extract all of those dependencies and let you know uh, in, a, so in a nice uh, organized list. But I think that humans should have this information too. Uh, we should not uh, relegate it to just to the machines. And not only that, the machines need to find that out somewhere. Someone needs to program it into them. So um, there is value in people having this information. Um, so today we'll be talking about these topics. Uh, we'll start some, we'll start some motivation. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Java and Java files in a nutshell. We'll talk about third-party dependency management tools in Java, and specifically those that you can find in Java files. Um, this will include Maven, which will include the POM XML and some basics, and the OSGI initiative, which will uh, we'll take a look at the manifest file that is included in Java files. And at the end, we'll take a look at Java class loading, which after all of those third-party dependency management tools have done their job, that's what actually Java takes and what loads. So I've made this graph, nice graphic, so we can follow it from a high level to a low level. Uh, let's start with Java. So what is Java? Um, Java is a high-level language. Um, it was uh, made as a response to a problem where uh, developers had to uh, recompile the code each time for a new machine, which was wasteful in, in terms of time. And the, you sometimes even had to rewrite your code to take a specific use of specific uh, functionality in different uh, machines. So Java came as a, as a solution to that, where developers could write once and then run it anywhere they want. This, uh, this, is, this was solved using something called the Java Virtual Machine. Uh, the Java virtual machine, basically each, mach each machine that wants to run some kind of Java code first compiles and installs a virtual machine that takes that Java bytecode and then it, uh, it runs it itself so the machine doesn't have to actually know the Java. Uh, and this allows sort of universality in our trans. Um, I'm sure pretty much everyone has seen this, kind of, this picture at some point or another. Uh, it's even become a meme, I think, at this point. Everything runs Java. Um, and I think that that's why this talk and this uh, topic is important because you, anywhere you go, you'll find things that run Java and things that run Java usually depend on other things. So um, Java itself is actually quite old. Um, it was first uh, released in 1995. The first officially supported version was released in early 1996. And the problem that that, uh, that, that, that creates in, a, in the programming language that we use today, that's used in, with open source and with sharing of various projects, is that open source wasn't as big of a thing back then in, the terms, in terms of Java and its uh, sharing of resources. So today, lots of projects include dependencies as opposed to back then. Actually, so many dependencies that your dependencies have themselves dependencies. Um, Transitive dependencies are quite a significant um, topic in today's uh, open source world and it creates quite a few uh, problems. So, uh, and the tools we'll look at today 
they will all address this problem in one way or another. But before we continue, I want to talk about jars. So what is a jar? A jar is basically a zip file uh, that can include anything. Uh, you can put any file you want in it, but if you want a specific kind of jar, it's called an executable jar, which is the kind of file that you can uh, use the Java command and run it, it has to follow a specific structure, which looks like this. So um, it basically there's two main folder, uh, folder chains. The first one is the one that includes your classes. Uh, for example, here it's in the org example uh, folder structure. And the other one is the meta in folder, which includes various uh, metadata about the jar file and includes several interesting files to look at, such as the POM XML file and the manifest file. So how do I actually find those dependencies in the jar file? Uh, let's take a look at Maven. So the Maven uh, uses the file called POM XML. Um, and uh, a few fun facts about Maven. So the, the, the name of Maven means one who understands in Yiddish. Um, it's a tool for building and managing Java programs, um, and it provides a way to share those uh, projects uh, with other people. This is done for the Ma Maven central repository, uh, where you can, you can upload your uh, projects and download others using Maven as well. So this is what a POM XML looks like. Uh, it's quite, quite a simple POM XML. Um, and you'll notice that at the bottom, there's a section for dependencies. So each dependency uh, object will, will be comprised of a group ID, an artifact ID, and a version. Um, all, those, uh, all those fields uh, Maven uses to find which specific artifacts you're looking at in the Maven central repository. Um, now, as for tools that Maven provides for managing those dependencies, one that is, uh, that is quite commonly found is something called a dependency scopes. So, dependency scopes basically allow uh, Maven to adjust the way uh, those dependencies are handled, from the way they are handled, uh, handled in the class path that Maven sets, which we'll talk about in a moment, to the way that transitive dependencies themselves are included in those projects. Um, so there are six scopes. We won't talk about too much about those scopes. It's a little bit out of, out of scope, pun not intended, uh, for our discussion. But uh, um, in, these, in these slides that I've uploaded online, you can go and look at that. Um, I've hidden those here. They're available there. There's a little bit more information. So now that Maven has found all of your, all of your uh, dependencies, how does it actually place them into a jar file? So. Um, Maven, we need to acknowledge the fact that Maven uses something called plugins. So, uh, some people even call Maven a sort of a, pl a plugin running framework because there's a whole hell of a lot of plugins and they're all very important. So, the plugins we'll take a look at today um, are called the Maven Assembly plugin and the Maven Shade plugin. Um, those are the ones that are currently recommended to be used and the ones you'll find most often. So, the Maven Assembly plugin. It has several options. Um, we look at specifically an option called jar with dependencies, which what it does, it's quite as the name suggests, it, takes, it creates a jar that has all of, its, all of your dependencies included in them. So the way it does that is it includes them all within the same jar file, which is often called an Uber jar. Now, the problem with including all of your dependencies in a single jar file is that you can run into a problem of classes overrunning each other. So, for example, if you include log4j, for example, and then some project includes you and log4j, at some point when those classes get loaded, you have the same class appearing twice. Um, and we'll touch on class loading in a moment and why that's a problem, but it's a problem and um, it's, not, it's not a good situation. So, uh, how it happens is that it takes all of those dependencies and it unpacks them and it takes all of those class files that are unpacked from those jars and places them into your jar file. Um, this, you, you can understand the problem when you start including too many dependencies with this problem. You'll eventually run into a situation where you have the same classes appearing in the same place and they'll have the same fully qualified name and that's a problem. So a different plugin was created to solve this situation called the Maven Shade plugin. Now it does basically the same thing but what it changes is that it shades all of, your, uh, all of your dependencies. Now, what is shading? Shading basically means to take those classes that you added and you change their name a little bit, somewhere in the path. 
which means that if you include more and more and more dependencies, they won't have the same name. And because they won't have the same name, they won't override each other, and it solves that collision problem. Um, the next tool that Maven provides, which is, uh, um, helps uh, manage dependencies, is called the POM Parents. It's not really a feature, it's more of a way, uh, a way that it works. Um, if, when you have a POM XML file, it can inherit from another POM XML file, um, and it inherits all of its, uh, all of its uh, fields. So uh, if, a, if a parent dis, uh, defines some kind of dependency, the child will have the same dependency. Um, the child can override each, uh, each field, and that creates some interesting dependency management uh, scenarios. Well, for example, the parent uh, defines the specific uh, group ID and artifact ID, but doesn't define the version. And so the children can define their own version or any other combinations you can think of. So what happens if we have a project that depends on the same de dependency twice with two different versions? So um, Maven has a specific solution to that, which is that it includes the nearest dependency to the project. So what do I mean by nearest? Uh, let's take a look at these three of dependencies. Let's assume A is our, our project. And then as you can see that throughout all of those dependencies, eventually we depend on uh, dependency D of two different versions. Uh, what happens in this scenario is that Maven will include version 1.0. What this means that if C uses any kind of functionality that is provided in 2.0, it won't have it and this can, ca can cause various exceptions and problems with running your code. So if you want to include the specific version of, of a dependency, if we go by the same kind of logic, you can just include as a direct dependency. And when, when you do that, specifically version 2.0 will be included and that's the one that will be used. Um, and if you're looking at it from an adversarial standpoint or as a researcher, that's the one that you should be looking at. So 1.0 just will be dis completely discarded. Um, the next one we're talking about is called the OSGI. Um, so OSGI is a framework for modular Java programs. Um, it was as defined, uh, it was made to solve a problem where, uh, where back then there was no modularity in Java. It was a monolithic program that loaded monolithic programs and sometimes loaded dependencies. It was, the, it was created the first version as early as 1999. So it defines a specific um, kind of um, specific kind of manifest, specific kind of handshake that various bundles, as they're called, uh, use. So they can more interact in a more modular way. So the main configuration file for OSGI is called the manifest is the manifest file, which appears also without. Uh, so let's take a look at it right now. So this is a very generic uh, manifest file. Um, it includes uh, the three first lines are mandatory. The next ones um, are included when you use, um, when you use an uh, executable jar file. Uh, we'll talk about the class path and the main class uh, fields in a moment. But when you use the, the OSGI framework, you have a few more headers that are mandatory. And if you see tho those headers in the manifest file, you know that manifest file belongs, probably belongs to an OSGI bundle. Um, and it can, run, it can run as an OSGI bundle. Now, how does an OSGI bundle actually include those dependencies? Well, it's another field in the manifest file. It looks like this usually. I know, scary, lots of text, but the important part is the import package one. Um, when you see that, everything that comes after that is a comma-separated list of just under uh, packages uh, that OSGI uh, defines. So that, that was OSGI. Now, uh, let's talk about what happens when we take those third-party dependency tools and we send them to Java. So, the manifest file, we've talked about it, we've just seen it. Now, let's talk about those two fields that we haven't, that I um, glossed over a moment before. The main class uh, field, it includes, it must include the fully qualified name of your, the, your program's main class. So if, when you want to actually run the program, that's where Java will look for it when it, when it starts running. Um, and the next one we'll talk about is the class path, which gets its own separate field because it's quite uh, important. So uh, this is the class path. You may not like it, but that's the class path. So the class path is basically an information booth. 
uh, when Java wants to actually find the classes that you're using, where it goes, it goes here. It goes to the class path and looks for all of those classes. Um, this tells it where they are, and then it, it's, it sends all of the class loaders, which we'll touch, touch on in a moment, to those places. So, um, it's basically, uh, the default of it is the current directory from which you're running the Java program, um, but you can set it manually. You can set it using the environment variable, using the class path argument for the Java command, or in the manifest file, as we saw before. But what happens to the things that are on the class path? So how does it get resolved? So let's say we have the org test example class, which is located in my package. Then what happens is that my package, that top level package directory must be in the class path, and the class file must be in the uh, org test subdirectories. Now, if one concluded a jar file, we need to put the jar file itself on the class path. Uh, but the class that we want to use itself has to be in an internal structure in the jar file, in, for example, org test example. So uh, we need to acknowledge that there is a split in Java. Uh, what happened before Java 9 and what happened after Java 9. So, uh, Java 9 introduced some various features um, into, the, into Java, specifically about modularity. Uh, we'll touch about those in a moment, but let's first focus on what happened before Java 9, the, the classic way. So, what's class loading? When you have a class that appears on the class path, someone has to load it into the Java virtual machine so you can use it. So, that's where the class loaders come in. The class loaders, they load your classes, but they also load uh, various Java internal classes, such as Java util, Java lang, all of those have, need to be loaded themselves. Um, there are three class loaders. They're called the bootstrap loader, the extension class loader, and the user or system uh, class loader. Um, each, of one, each one handles a slightly different, uh, slightly different kind of uh, uh, loading of different classes. So, the bootstrap class loader um, is kind of an exception to the two others. What it does is it loads the Java core platform uh, classes themselves. Java util, Java lang, as, as I said before. It loads them from rt.jar. You can modify it from code, but we won't talk about that. It's a little bit out of scope. Um, we just need to acknowledge it, that it's there. Um, the second class loader is called the extension class loader. What it does is that it loads all of the files from JRE libext and you can't modify it. Again, it's out of scope, we won't touch about it too much, but we'll talk about the next one, which is the system class loader. So what it does is it loads the classes from the class path that we've provided. Um, it loads them, um, it loads them to the Java virtual machine for you, for you to use, but it also uh, has another functionality that it loads classes that you generate at runtime. Um, so, the, uh, but when it does happens, there's a, there's, um, a certain situation we've, we've touched upon uh, in terms of the what happens if you include the same class twice. Um, so this is where this rule comes in, that there can be only one. Um, once you try to import a class, you can only import it one, one time. Um, if you try to import it a second time, it just won't, won't get loaded. So. Um, this is done uh, because it, it all, lo every class is gets imported using uh, its fully qualified name. And if it were to allow two of them, you'd have just uh, undefined, the undefined the situations where you reference two things at the same time. That can happen. So in Java 9, what we had uh, added is called the module system. So the module system was made to increase the modularity of Java programs and to reduce the size of uh, all, all of the loaded projects that you use, including Java itself. So what Java noticed is that whenever you run a program, you load the entirety of the Java, pro of the Java platform, which is at that time became quite, quite large. So they wanted to reduce that. Um, and by providing a sort of modularity, you reduce the size because you can separate the Java util, Java lang, and so on into different pack into different modules, which were of smaller size. And by the way, it can also improve the security of Java because 
um, if you don't load something, any ad adversary that eventually gets access to your uh, system somehow and has uh, the ability to run Java code or run as your Java code, it just won't have access to some of the functionality that it would have, would have had if, you did, if the Java core wasn't split into modules. Um, in practical terms, what changed is that we have a new uh, variable called the module path. Uh, the module path is basically just like the class path, just for modules. Um, it's, and instead of using the class loader, it uses a module loader. Um, it's quite similar in its, uh, in its functionality for our purposes. So specific changes that we have to acknowledge is that if you try to import from one side to another, for example, from a modular jar, you want to load a non-modular jar, um, it won't happen. You can just put it on the class path and it, it won't get loaded. So um, that's because the module system, it doesn't really want to go outside. It doesn't want you to get all messy with the, with the regular class path system. So what you have to do is you need to load that in with the module, uh, with the module path. What happens is it gets converted into the default module. Now, the other way, if you try to load the modular jar uh, from a non-modular jar, um, it again won't work over the module path because the module path was, the module system was never invoked. So it doesn't go looking for it there. You can override this using the add module pro, uh, command in the Java executable, um, which will inv uh, tell the module program that it needs to start actually working it. It needs to do the loading itself. So let's do a quick recap of about what, what, what we've talked about uh, so far. So um, we looked at the POM XML. We looked at the manifest file. Um, we've spoken about a little bit about class loading. And we looked, took a look about Java 9 modularity and what, how it affects that. So why is it important? Why did they actually choose to talk to you about all of this information? Um, as we said before, Java is a huge programming language. It's everywhere. It's uh, pretty much every computer, every even not computer, any kind of electronic device runs Java. And because because of that, um, the the security posture of that language is quite like, quite wide. But the thing is that the resources for this uh, for this programming language just isn't aren't as good as other languages. And just the information that I've shown you so far you can't go to a single place and have it. You have to go scouring for it yourself. So, um, but, so, but the thing that uh, is actually important about this and the reason that I've chosen to spoke about this is supply chain security. So if we, if we want to secure our dependency management and actually have a more secure supply chain, we need to understand how it works. We need to know how those dependencies are managed. We need to know how dependencies are added. We need to know how they actually run. Um, and even uh, if we look at Maven and how it works, if we don't take a look at class loading and the specifics of it, we'll lose the bigger picture. Some things that um, Maven adds sometimes just won't get loaded into the class path. Or even if it is in the class path, it won't get loaded into Java Virtual Machine. Um, and at that point, um, if, we, we, if we don't focus our security, and we focus our attention on the right places, we'll end up with a lot of wasted work. But more than wasted work, um, if we are alert for every dependency that we've just found somewhere, um, we are to create alert fatigue. Um, and too much alert fatigue can be uh, quite a problem for our dependent, for uh, various uh, managers of projects, for developers. Um, and I think that reducing uh, alert fatigue is one of the biggest challenges and more, most important uh, things that we can focus on right now. Because even if we can solve every vulnerability, um, not having the time to do it, not having the focus to actually go and take care of the important parts, um, just will take, make all of, that, uh, all of that work irrelevant. So um, by looking at the, at, at the right places, knowing what goes where, uh, we can reduce that. So um, if anyone wants to read a little bit more about what we've discussed, um, and just a little bit more about, maybe about dependencies and how it works, um, take a look at uh, these uh, places. Ant, Ivy, and Grader are both third-party dependency management tools. Um, they both provide um, the similar functionality to Maven. Uh, they often use Maven itself. 
we didn't discuss those because they don't have a footprint in the jar file, um, so it was a little bit out of scope. Um, you can look at the internals of Maven and OSGI. Um, let me warn you, OSGI can get quite complex. They have quite, uh, they've thought everything through quite deeply. Um, for example, when we talked about the way Maven handles um, two, depending on two different versions of the same dependency, um, OSJ is a completely different solution to that, and it's, uh, it involves uh, quite uh, complex mathematics. Um, so we need to go into that. Um, you can read about more about class loading, uh, but I warn you, it comes pretty much uh, hand in hand with the Java security model. Um, they're interesting subjects, but then also quite complex and quite technical. Um, and yeah, so um, thank you very much. Um, you can find me as that on Twitter or X or whatever. Um, I don't really tweet or X, so your choice. Um, and that's my email. Um, so um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that um, both behaviors can be justified. You can justify both the behavior of looking at all of the dependencies and all, everything that may be included. Um, but yeah, I think that as um, that we should be uh, more focusing on the way that things that are actually run, um, because as I said, alert fatigue is quite a significant problem, and we need to have, find ways to reduce it. Um, and at the end of the day, if something doesn't get run something doesn't actually reach the execution uh, point, um, it's, it's less important. It is still important because uh, malicious users can utilize things that are not actually running but are present, but we need to prioritize things by how big of a problem they are, by how, um, how much the uh, exposure of that can fall face, uh, pose a risk. Okay? Anyone else? Any questions? All right. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>